Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you guys. Will you stand with us as we pray and ask God to be in the midst? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to do just that, God. We want to just come before you, God, in thanksgiving and recognition that you are the giver of life. You are the giver of all that is good, Lord. And um, we get to be here and we get to live another day and we get to gather in your name and worship you and, and hear from your word. Lord, the message that you want to give us today, Lord. And so we pray, God, that you would um, help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth and to be open and um, pliable to your word, Lord, whatever it is that you want to show us today. Lord, we thank you, God, that we can gather. And we just ask that you would bless us with your presence, Lord. We lift up those that maybe, for whatever reason, Lord, came in here hurting. And maybe they came here not knowing, um, being lied to by the enemy. We pray, God, that today uh, the message of grace and mercy and redemption would shine through. So we love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. We all say, Amen. Let's worship.
So open up our eyes, surround us with your light, your love endures forever, for your love endures forever, oh your love endures forever. So open up our eyes, surround us with your light, your love endures forever. His praise glorious, glorious, glorious. For his name is glorious, glorious, glorious. So make his praise, so make his praise. So make his praise. For his 
his name, for his name is glory. we do again thank you Lord Lord for this time that you've given us to worship you Lord we come before you in song lifting your name up God worthy Lord you are we thank you Jesus meet us here Lord may we not just be here singing songs Lord but Lord may we be praying them crying them out from the depths of our heart to you Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. Thank you for loving us. Though the battle rages and we will stand and fight, though the armies rise against us on sides. Come on, guys. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. Though the battle rages, we will stand and fight. Though the battle rages, we will stand and fight. Though the armies rise against us on all sides. We will not be shaken, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken. Though the battle, though the battle rages, we will stand and fight. Though the armies rise against us on all sides, we will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. How about you? 
want you guys to sing it out. Though the battle. Though the battle. Though the battle rages, though 
the arms of the arms. We will for in the hour, for in the hour of our darkest day. Tremble, we won't be afraid. Our hope is rising like the light of dawn. Our God is with us, He has overcome. For we trust, for we trust. No matter what comes our way, Lord, we will not be shaken, Lord, because we're standing on your truth, your word, Lord. We thank you again, Lord, for your presence here. Have your way, Lord, with us. Thank you.
It's your breath. Amen. Good morning again, all of you. So you guys can have a seat. We're going to have some bulletin announcements to, uh, to share with you real quick. It's good to see all of you. We want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Almani, especially if it's your first time here. Welcome. Um, bulletin announcements. We wanted to let you know, if you can't smell them, that we have burritos in the back today. Um, we prayed over them because they're chorizo with sausage and hash browns and beans and salsa. So... Uh, we, we ask the Lord, please let them go to the, through the arteries, straight through. Protect our people, Lord. Um, it's, for, it's for good. You know, I, I think of just uh, things that the team that went to Cambodia was, uh, was able to do, the Lord was able to do through them, um, through you guys eating burritos and pozole and the whole thing. And I'm just excited with what, what he's going to do in Nepal. And so what an opportunity for us to be able to kill three birds with one stone. We eat because that's what we do. We grub afterwards, right? We fellowship. And, uh, and we support the uh, Nepal missions in October. And so go to the back after. And um, like Manny had said earlier, if it's too hot for you, we also um, serve them to go. So you can take them with you in your, in your car in the AC and grub in there, okay? Uh, another thing we want to let you know is that there's going to be a leader's teacher's class today. It's a leader's a servant teacher's class at 2 p.m. So if you signed up for that, we're meeting in room two at 2 p.m. And, of course, we welcome anyone that would like to go. Uh, ladies, we want to remind you that the ladies' night out is this Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, July 25th at 6.30. Um, today is the last day to sign up, ladies. So if you haven't signed up, please make sure that you do so today. It's $10. And that covers the dinner and the dessert. Um, it's going to be a blessing because the guest speaker is going to be Christine Torres from Calvary Chapel, Hollywood. And the ladies always show up. It's a good um, opportunity for you ladies to get to know each other and get to know each other's names and so forth. It's important that we fellowship. Um, and so ladies, sign up today for that uh, ministry meeting and overseer meeting. We're having two meetings on that day, Sunday, July 30th. The ministry meetings at 2 p.m. It's for everyone that serves or is interested in serving. And then the overseer, of course, is for the overseers, which would happen after that meeting. Uh, men, we just want to keep reminding you that uh, up probably until uh, the beginning of September, we're going to be looking at uh, taking signups for the retreat. We're going up to uh, Twin Peaks, the mountains for the weekend of 15th through the 17th. And so... Especially those that have never, that have never gone, we, we would encourage you to take a step of faith and go with us up the mountain because it's a blessing. It's $180, $40 saves your spot, and if you're paying in payments, it won't, it won't hurt the pocketbook as much, okay? Uh, singles ministry starting tomorrow, there's going to be a, a singles ministry opportunity. The Lord opened the door for that uh, Monday, July 24th at 7 p.m., and then meeting the second and fourth Monday of every month. Uh, for singles, those of you that like together, uh, you're not married, and it's just to be able to, to discuss uh, the purpose of you being single and, and going through the, the Word of God uh, together, and so we want to encourage you to do so if you're single. Uh, youth Summer Camp, if you signed up your youth uh, for the camp, uh, today is a day that all the balances are due, so make sure you visit the table. You might have some questions about uh, that weekend or those weekends, so make sure you can uh, visit that table for that. Uh, keep the jet team in prayer. They're going to be going out the, this Saturday, the 29th, to the streets of Almani to invite people to the Harvest Crusade. Yesterday we had quite a few people that um, normally haven't gone out, and it was a blessing to see them being led by the Lord to go out and invite people to harvest. And so if that's you, that you can you know, come next Saturday at 10 and go out to the streets with the jet team to, to invite people to the Harvest Crusade. Um, if um, you're going to uh, uh, Kern River camping in August, there's going to be a meeting, a mandatory meeting, at least for one family member that's going to take place Sunday, August 6th at 3 p.m. And so if you're going, make sure that at least one person from your family attends that meeting because they're going to be collecting balances and just talking about the final details of, of this trip. It's going to be a blessing. Uh, we've been praying about live streaming. Just so you know, if, if you know someone that maybe is a shut-in or they can't come to church or for whatever reason, 
Um, we, we're actually testing our live streaming. Live streaming is when you have the service going on at the same time. So people are actually watching service with us now uh, via the internet. It's through CCEM Live on YouTube. And so we're going to go live pretty soon on our website. And uh, prior to doing that, we're going to have a meeting uh, for those that want to serve. And so we're going to be meeting on Sunday, August 6th at 1 p.m. Okay, so hopefully we see some of you there because it's a, it's a blessing to be able to serve the Lord. I'm excited about the Summer Marriage Fellowship. We're going to be actually doing it off-site at a beautiful location. A couple opened the door to their home to have it um, in their garden. And so it's going to be nice. We're going to have games. There's going to be worship, a study. And so we want to um, encourage all you married and engaged couples to join us uh, for this Marriage Fellowship. It's going to be at 5 p.m. because it's off-site. And so we have a table where you can sign your name if you'd like to bring a potluck item and also to get directions for the location, okay? So make sure that you're a part of that if you're married or engaged. Uh, how many of you have, have not been baptized but are praying about getting baptized? Uh, one or two or three or four. Okay, cool. We're going to be having our summer baptisms on the 13th of August at 2 p.m. And so baptism isn't for the super Christian or else nobody can get baptized except Jesus right? Because he's the only one that was perfect. Baptisms are for Christians, for people who have given their heart to the Lord, who have received Jesus in their heart and now want to make an outward uh, a witness or an expression of that. It's also something that Jesus has called us to follow as, as his followers, as his, as, his, as his children, as his church. And so we're going to have baptisms in case you're saying, well, I already got baptized. Well, that was one or two that don't count. Um, it, it, it has to be when you make the decision to get baptized. And it's an opportunity to be able to invite family and friends so that they can witness what God is doing in your life. And so baptisms, Sunday, August 13th at 2 p.m. If you'd like to be baptized, let us know. Um, you can visit the table in the foyer to sign your name and also to get directions to the location where the baptism is going to be. And we invite anyone that would like to go to support those that are being baptized. And then a couple other things, Harvest Crusade decisions, follow-ups. Uh, there's an opportunity for us to serve as a church to uh, call people who have made decisions during the Harvest Crusade weekend, especially, especially people around that live in this area, to call them, encourage them, pray with them, and then invite them to come to church because it's important that they find a place of fellowship. And so if you'd like to serve in that uh, ministry, there's a table, uh, a harvest table with all kinds of harvest material that you can take with you, stickers and so forth. And also a sign-up sheet that you can sign up and let us know that you'd like to serve in that, uh, in that ministry. And then lastly, the Truth and Treat meeting is going to be held Sunday, August 13th at 1 p.m. That meeting is to get ready for our October, October 31st night where we have games and music and food and we take over that whole back parking lot. Um, we're, we're praying that God would raise a lot of servants because we need a lot of servants uh, to serve that night since it's probably one of the biggest events that we do where people from outside of the church come and we can pour in to them with love and pour into the kids uh, the truth, right? We give them candies, hook them up with candies, but we also give them truth uh, found in his word. And so pray about serving with us that day, especially if you're handy, guys are handy, you, you want to build, you, you're good with a hammer and stuff like that, let me know because there's opportunities for us to do, build a game or to build a stage and things like that. So, so see me for that, okay? I think that's it. Let's go ahead and let's pray together. As we pray to receive today's offering, Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you, God, so much for this opportunity, Lord, to be able to worship you. Because it is an opportunity, it's a, it's a privilege, God, because it's a, it's a cry of our heart, Lord, of, of what we have inside. It's, it's, it's something that we cannot um, keep inside, worship of who you are and what you've done for us, God. And so help us to do that, Lord. Um, more often than not, God, help us to do that every day. And, uh, Lord, as we get into your word, we pray that you would start preparing our hearts, Lord, to receive what you have for us today. Uh, Lord, we thank you, God, and we praise you. And as we receive today's offerings, Lord, we pray that you would multiply them, that you would bless them. And, uh, God, that you would give us wisdom as a ministry to use them for your glory and for your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Deserve it, still you give yourself away in all the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. In all the Till I'm found and leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still And all the overwhelming Never-ending reckless love of God Father, we thank you, Lord, for in that simple truth, Lord, that you love us no matter what. That we can sit here, Lord, and be here today, Lord, with our junk. The things we struggle with. But you love us the same. You don't look at us any different. You don't love us any less. You love us just the same, God. Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. Strengthen us in areas we fall short. Be with us this morning, God. Thank you again for the privilege it is to worship you, to come before you clean. No matter what the enemy may say to us as we walk in this morning, we're no good. Are you kidding me? Whatever lies he pitches at us, God, we know that you're right there in front of us. You say, get out of the way. We thank you, God, for that. Thank you for your love and your grace. For dying on a cross for each and every person. Be with us now, Lord, we thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name together. We all agreed and said, man, before you guys take a seat, turn to each other and say good morning. Okay, good morning. How you guys doing today? You doing all right? What a neat time of worship, huh? You know, uh, just to encourage you in that, you know, um, I, I want to just, just, just kind of remind you that that time of singing songs uh, to the Lord from the heart is so powerful. It's so life-changing. And uh, I even believe that well, as you just, Worship, even at home, I you know encourage you throw on the the praise music. The enemy hates it, and you'll find uh, that your life will change. And and not only that, you know we do announcements during worship, and we receive the offering because uh, worship is more than music. It's uh, it's service, and all those uh, announcements that that Pastor Henry is sharing with you, 
you know, I do encourage you, you know, take advantage of them. Maybe take a step of faith, uh, sign up for a study or attend one of the events or something. Because uh, the Bible talks about that in Romans 12, how our, our service is worship, you know. And so don't let it end there. Don't let it end with the songs. Uh, I encourage you to live a life of worship. Super excited that you're here today. Uh, any of you planning on getting burritos afterwards, just out of curiosity? I haven't had chorizo in a while, so um, I, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I will. I'm not sure. But, you know, it's going to be cool going down in Nepal. First time for me, but God's doing a work there. And so if you can uh, support it, that would be a blessing. Uh, I just want to just let you guys know that um, you know, just in case you're here and I uh, was uh, – I don't know. I, I don't know the band. I'm old, and uh, I don't know the band too well, uh, Linkin Park. But I heard that the, the lead singer recently committed suicide. And, uh, and it's like another one, huh? You know, the guys, they have everything. They have fun. They have fame. They have fortune. But, you know, the enemy comes in, and he robs them of a future. He robs them of that hope. And so... You know, again, talking to someone today after service uh, who's struggling with those thoughts of suicide, I just want to make sure that I throw out this out there, that if you're here and sometimes you get those thoughts of uh, taking your life, please understand that that's from the devil himself. You know, he tries to paint this picture that you have no hope, that you have no future, but, but you do. I mean, God has amazing plans, and I, and I tell Every person that I talk to, every person that I, I get to sit down with and talk to, you know, I, I, I tell them from the bottom of my heart, God has amazing plans for you. And, you know, and someone might hear, hear me say that to him and to her and to them or whatever, and they might come up to me and say, man, you tell everyone that. But it's true. <laughs> it's true. Do you believe that for yourself? I mean, I believe that God, when God knit you together in your mother's womb, that he had a, a destiny, a dream, a mission, a work, a life, and that is great. So whatever you do, I, I just beg you, if you're here today and you're struggling with that, don't struggle with it alone. Let us know. Pray with us. And whatever you do, don't lose hope because God has a future for you. I, I always tell people, John 10, 10, the Bible says the thief has come to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. And so the agenda of the devil is to steal you from God, make you take your life, kill you, and destroy you forever. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and just an amazing life. And so prayerfully, you know, you follow the Lord and you give your life to Christ, okay? Uh, how many of you guys were here for the men's breakfast yesterday? It's out of curiosity. It was cool, huh? Really cool. We got a, a really neat study from uh, Pastor Ryan we, Hussein. Uh, if you were not here and you want to get a CD, just uh, let them know in the back and they'll give you the audio message. It was, a, it was really encouraging to hear his story and to hear the words spoken out of 2 Timothy chapter 2. So anyways, I want to tell you guys about those things. If you have a Bible today, let's open up to Mark chapter 14. As we continue our journey through this gospel, today we're, we're cut, studying a couple of things. Number one, the, the Jewish trials, and we're going to learn a lot from that. And then number two, Peter's denials. You know, look what we read here in Mark 14, in verse 53. It says, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And it's kind of cool, as we go through this section, there's like, uh, we're going to study these two things. And in the verse, first two verses, he brings them up. Number one, the, the Jewish trials, and number two, Peter's denials. Jesus Christ is on his way to the cross. He's on his way, you know, to die. And, you know, he's not doing it, you know, without that voluntary submission to the Father. He said, no one takes my life 
I lay it down. And so we're watching him do that. We saw him pray in the garden and he sweat, you know, drops of blood, hematidrosis, man. It made the skin real sensitive. And so, you know, he wrestled with that. And, and there on his knees in prayer, he won the battle in that he made the decision to go to the cross. And, and so we're seeing this whole journey as he's betrayed by Judas with a kiss and then arrested by the Jewish uh, leaders. And we're going to see as this whole thing unfolds that there's actually three Jewish trials, three Roman trials. First, he's going to go to Annas. Uh, he was the former high priest. Then he's going to go to Caiaphas, who was the current high priest. And then in the morning, in the wee hours of the morning, he's going to stand before the Sanhedrin in the temple precincts. So those are three Jewish trials. Everything about it was illegal, we're going to see. And then there's the three Roman trials. And first he stands before Pilate, and then he stands before Herod, and then he stands before Pilate again. And so six trials. And then they condemn him. You guys know the story. They scourged him. They marred him more than any man, the Bible says, so that when you looked at him, you couldn't even tell his face belonged to the face of a man. And so, you know, you look at those things, the Lord on his way to the cross, we're, we're, we're watching this, we're seeing this, how our Lord loved us so much that he went to the cross the way that he did. You know, we're going to see, I think, in looking at the Lord, just hopefully you, you, there's gratitude here that God died for you, that you realize that. But, you know, just as a side note, too, this is how we die. You know, he died for our sins. We have to die to self if we're going to live that resurrected life. And so we're going to learn kind of how he did it. And I think God will minister to us a lot of cool things, you know, when Jesus was betrayed, arrested, and led away, it was after midnight. And, uh, you know, he basically didn't sleep all night. So it's in the wee hours of Friday morning before the dawn. And he's dragged through multiple trials, stands before the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish Supreme Court. And then we see that he's indicted. In John 18, verse 13, they led him away. The Bible says to Annas first, because he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And I think it helps to know a little bit of the background because we really need to see the way that it was completely unjust. Now, Annas, he goes to Annas first. Why? Why does he go to Annas first? Because he's the dude with power. He is like the president of Israel. I mean, Annas was the guy with all the power. Uh, we have a lot of information about Annas in, in history he served as high priest for seven years. Uh, later, that position was filled by five of his sons, his son-in-law and his grandson. Basically, that position of power never went far from him and his family. History tells us that he enjoyed all the dignity of the office and all its influence since he was able to promote those who most closely were connected to him. And so word on the street was that they acted publicly, but Annas really directed the affairs of the Jewish leaders. You know, Annas was rich. He was enormously wealthy with all the money they brought in in the temple precincts. You remember the way that they would sell the sacrifices there? They would gorge the people, jack up the price, the money changers, all that stuff. You remember how all that business was going on in the temple? That money was going to Annas. So he was rich. And so in John chapter 2, you guys remember the story when the Lord went in the temple and he said, get out of town. Remember? He cast all those guys out. He said, this is supposed to be the house of prayer. He did it in the beginning of his ministry. He did it at the end. I mean, what is he doing? He is hitting Annas in his money belt, right? So from the beginning, this guy who is really the most influential man in Israel wants Jesus dead. So one of the things that you got to know about this trial is it's not fair. Nothing about it is fair. You know, when you look at this, it's just crazy how illegal it all was. You know, a lot of you probably have heard of that, that Jewish uh, law called the Mishnah. How many of you are familiar with the Mishnah? 
the, the, the Orthodox Jews believe that the first five books of Moses were given to him by God and he wrote them down. So we have, you know, in Genesis all the way through uh, Deuteronomy, right? The, the Torah, that's the written law. But the Orthodox Jews also believe that God uh, spoke a law to Moses and he passed on the oral law. He didn't write it down. And so from generation to generation, uh, the Orthodox Jews believed that, that that oral tradition was passed down verbally, eventually was written down, but that's uh, a portion of the Mishnah. And so it was law in the land, and according to the Mishnah, this, these are the rules for court. One of the things you're going to see is that God's justice system is absolutely amazing. You know, they broke all the laws in the Mishnah as they're trying our Lord. Uh, one was capital cases were to be held during the day, not the night, so that was illegal. Number two, the verdict in capital cases had to be reached during the day, not the night. They condemned Jesus twice in the night. Number three, capital cases were to begin with reasons for acquittal and not, they were not permitted to begin with reasons for conviction. So, you know, any of you guys ever gone to court, just out of curiosity? You know what I'm talking about? Imagine going to court and the law said, before you can present the case of whether or not he's guilty, let's hear all the evidence that he's innocent. That was the law according to the Mishnah. Uh, number four, in capital cases, a verdict of acquittal, that means he's not guilty, that was permitted to be reached in day one, but not guilty. And they, they wanted these guys to be fair. Think about it. Go home. Pray about it. Don't convict someone on day one. The court was forbidden to meet on any of the great feasts, uh, and here they are meeting on Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, number six, if the verdict was a verdict of death, a night was required to lapse before the death sentence could be carried out. And so they said Jesus is going to die. Uh, I mean, it was crazy. They arrested him midnight. He goes to these trials. 9 a.m., 9 o'clock in the morning, he was nailed to the cross. I mean, there was nothing legal about this court. Jewish law said the high priest was forbidden to ask a leading question Number eight, it also forbids anyone to ask questions in which the person on trial could incriminate himself. They were so fair, they said, listen, if anyone's going to be put to death, it has to be on the testimony of other witnesses. And so all these laws were passed over by the Jewish court. And look what we read in verse 55 as they bring Jesus in. This is the second trial. Now, the chief priests and all the council... They, they sought testimony against Jesus to do what? Just to put him to death. Not to find out, you know, if he's guilty or not. No, look back at chapter 14, verse 1, if you would. Remember, it says after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and, and put him to death. I mean, why even bother going through a trial? I mean, that was their agenda, right? They, they wanted to kill him. Back in verse 55, they, they sought that testimony but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. And then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. You know, they weren't gathered together for justice. They were gathered together for murder. There were some witnesses that were called, but we read right here in verse 56 that their testimonies didn't agree. When we do have a quotation, they misquoted Jesus. Jesus didn't say, destroy the temple made with hands. He said, I'll destroy this temple made without hands. And so we see they were lying, right? Right? It was a, a, a capital offense to say that you were going to destroy the Jewish temple, but that's, they, they couldn't find two witnesses for that. You know, according to the Gospel of John, uh, Caiaphas, the high priest who he's standing before now, had already determined weeks ago that Jesus would die in John 11, 49 through 52. And so uh, just I, I kind of want you guys to see the illegal assembly and testimony only proved that Jesus was blameless. 
just in case, man, there's some weird people out there, but just in case someone comes and says, well, he went to court and they convicted him and he was, he was guilty, absolutely not. He was innocent, right? And so the high priest sees that this isn't going anywhere. And so in verse 60, it says, And the high priest stood up in the midst and he asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. You know, one of the interesting things uh, as you go through these trials, and, you know, I, I hate to bring it up, but I know how people are. Like, you guys remember the OJ trials? Some of you guys probably remember those, man. It is kind of weird to me. It's kind of weird to me that people were so interested in that. I mean, there were some people I remember where I used to work. They didn't even work. I mean, they were just watching it when they were supposed to be working. And, and I told my boss, get to work, dude. I mean, I was trying to... <laughs> Why are, are people so interested in that? Even today, they're so interested in O.J. Simpson. That trial. What about this trial? I mean, I would be interested in this. I mean, this is when God died for us. I want to know everything about this. I want to watch it. I want to read it. I want to study it. I want to learn it. There's a lot to learn, really, it's interesting to me how, you know, the high priest rises up and there he is and all his, you know, whatever, men glory with his outfit and his position and prestige and, you know, and, and he just he starts hammering the Lord. In the Greek language, it's in the imperfect tense. It means he kept asking him. And so, you know, the Lord, he didn't say anything. It was, it was we're going to see through six trials Generally speaking, the Lord was silent. He was quiet. He's not like us. Huh. How many of you here wish you were a little more quiet, just out of curiosity, you know? And, and you know, I, I'll be honest with you, that's part of dying to self. You know, your husband says something, your wife says something, your kids say something, the dog barks, I mean, you name it. And, and here we are right away defending ourselves and just, you know, saying what, you know, our case and how innocent we are and all that stuff. And, and here's our Lord showing, how, showing us how it's done. I mean, he's just quiet. He's silent, right? And, and some silence is good, not all of it, but some of it is. You know, there's a Jewish proverb that says, eloquent silence often is better than eloquent speech. You just got to know when, right? A Bulgarian proverb says, silence irritates the devil. I like that. Because there's a devil trying to make you say something that lights a fire. You know, you're fighting with your spouse or whoever it might be, someone at work, you know, and the, the Lord says, hey, just be like me. You know, just be slow to speak. You know, Jesus' silence is sent a message of innocence, really, I mean, it was obvious that he was innocent, but there's another saying that says, he who doesn't understand your silence will probably never understand your words. And in one sense, that's how it was. The Lord had shown them who he was, right? And when you, when you read John chapter 5, and Jesus himself talks about the fourfold witness of uh, the works that he does, of John the Baptist's testimony, Everybody knew that John was a prophet. Who could do these works that he's doing? Who could speak these words that he's speaking? You know, and then there's a testimony of the Father. They were ignoring the voice of God who was telling them who Jesus was. Not only that, you have the prophetic word. You have the testimony of Jesus himself who said, I am. But they ignored it all. And so in one sense, there's also another subtle message that, you know, well, God, speak to me. God, speak to me. He already has. He's already told you what to do. A lot of times. A lot of times, that's what's going on in our life as Christians. God is just saying, love your wife. Oh, Lord, marriage is so hard. Marriage is so complicated, sophisticated. No, it's not. <laughs> love your wife. 
Submit to your husband. Be his helper. Oh, he's the head, but I'm the neck, and I want to make sure it happens. <laughs> no, you guys. I mean, you know, well, I want to hear like a fancy message, whatever, you know, and God's just saying, well, just to let you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you a fancy message. I already, I already told you what to do, and I'll tell you what, I'm not going to really say much else until you do what I told you to do. I, I called you to pray, and you're not. I called you to fast. I called you to be in the word. I called you to fellowship, and you're not. There's that element when Jesus is going through this whole thing, and it's interesting, it really it reeks, it reaches its pinnacle when he goes to Herod. He doesn't say a single word to Herod, not one word. Because he had already heard, why, why are you going to waste your voice? There's this beautiful silence that even Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah chapter 50, in verse 7, it says, uh, I'm sorry, 53, verse 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Through all the trials and even the torture, he spoke very little. And when I look at that, I realize he's not like us. We're not like him. We talk too much. We trust the Father too little. We defend ourselves with many words. You guys, let's be more like him. He was blameless. He was silent. You know, but the high priest, of course, he didn't give up. Look what we read in verse 61. Again, the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the, the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And again, this is where he's asking him over and over and over and over again in the Greek language, until finally Jesus responds in verse 62, and he said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes, which also was illegal, but he did it anyways, and he said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy, what do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death, then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. It, it was illegal for the high priest to ask a leading question. It was illegal for Jesus to be asked something that would incriminate himself. Witnesses were required. It was illegal to meet at night. It was illegal to reach a death sentence in one day or to do it at night. But all of this, all of this, it shows us the picture of his innocence and why he died. You know, when you see the final verdict, it all came down to the truth of who Jesus was. They couldn't handle it. He affirmed that he was the Christ, that he was the son of the blessed, that he was the son of man. And that was his favorite title for himself, you know. The Messiah, he claims deity, and he even points to his humanity. He says, yeah, it's true, that's who I am, and I just want to let you know, bro, that one day you're going to see me coming back. I'm going to be seated at the right hand of God, the place of power, and one day I'm going to be coming back on, on clouds. And what's that symbolic of the Shekinah glory of God? To do what? They knew what he would be coming back for. They knew the book of Daniel to judge the judges. Right? And so he just, he tears his clothes, blasphemy. He claims to be God. They didn't realize, so they would not believe. They closed their eyes. They hardened their hearts to the fact that he was indeed who he claimed to be. No, they had no excuse. Jesus had proven to them through the courts of life. But unfortunately, they did not listen. They weren't open. And so what did they do? They condemned him. And then we see things begin to get worse. They, they began to spit on him, right? Isaiah 50, verse 6, it predicted that, where the Messiah said, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had anyone spit in your face. 
I mean, it's just, it's humiliating. That's what the Lord went through. After they did that, they covered him, they blindfolded him, and then they began to beat him. Now, Chuck Smith was talking about how the way God made us. I was listening to a study by him, and he was just saying that the way that we're made, you guys, is so amazing. Any of you guys ever been in a fight, set of curiosity, you know, boxing, or just boxing, come on. <laughs> Some of you girls here, you're like, I've never been in a fight. And you were boxing with your sister, man. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. And so when you're boxing, the Lord made us in such a way that we react. I mean, it's just, a, we're amazing. We see it coming. And, you know, there's something about us that allows us to absorb it. But, but if you don't see it coming, if they blindfold you and then they hit you, that's what our Lord went through. You know, Chuck was talking about how quarterbacks, um, how when they play football, I don't know if you've ever seen the quarterbacks, but, you know, they're not, not all of them are that big. I mean, they're, you know, decent size, but not like the big guys that sack them, right? Those big old refrigerator guys, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, when they get that 300-pound guy on the quarterback, man, and, they, and, he's, and he sacks him, how does the quarterback bounce up from that? You want to know how? He, he kind of gets ready for it, right? He's, he, somehow he absorbs it. He might fall or whatever. But it's those times when he gets blindsided, when he's ready to pass and someone hits him, he doesn't see him coming. That's when he gets hurt the most. And in one sense, that's what Jesus went through for us. I mean, they began to spin on him. They put a bag over him. They beat him. So he couldn't see it coming. And then they said, prophesy. The other gospel tells us that they said, prophesy to us. Who hit you? And just think, the Lord could have answered, huh? He could have said, oh, I, you know, given a name. And he could have told everything about him. Everything that he ever went through. But he didn't. What is he doing? He's laying down his life for us he is showing us he is demonstrating to us how much he loves us i mean who else would do such a thing see when we look at this whole thing unfold we have to make sure that we see it for what it is you know you know i don't know when you when you look at this i, I don't know how your reaction is in one sense, you should be a little angry, you know? I mean, it's like these Jewish religious leaders, these guys that were hitting my Lord and, and that kind of stuff, it should make you angry. But, but I'll tell you what, you know, here's the thing. Even though this all went down as told and we need to study it just as history and information, it's good to know history. We also need to take and assume responsibility at the end of the day, why, why did he go through this? 1 Corinthians tells us, chapter 15, verse 3, Paul said, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. That's why. Isaiah 53, verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, so it's good to go through it and see, you know, he was blameless, he was silent, you learn lessons from it, it was unfair, unjust, he was innocent. But at the same time, in going through this, we got to understand that we were there doing this to him, that we have to uh, just claim our heart, our part in it, Right? I mean, I, I've mentioned to you that before that before I was a Christian, I committed murder. And you're like, oh, yeah, I killed God. I did this. It wasn't just Judas who betrayed him or the mockery of a trial on the religious leader's part. Really, it wasn't the Romans or the punishment of that guy Pontius Pilate. It was me. He died for, for me, for my sins. You know, the way that growing up, man, I, I used to be so mean and selfish and prideful and I hurt my, my mom and my dad and my, my friends and all the, the things that I do that I've done all my life. 
That's what put Jesus on the cross. And we all have to accept that. If you're honest, we have to admit that you killed God too. Now, thank God he didn't stay dead or we'd be in big trouble. But as, as we study this, it's important to admit our part in his pain. You know, John Stott, he said something stunning. He said, before we can begin to see the cross as something for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Well, we're going to see as we go through our study today that it kind of all works together like that. When we look at the, the Jewish trials, and then secondly, Peter's denials. Now we read in verse 54 that, that Peter followed at a distance. We also read there that he warmed himself at the fire. And John tells us it was cold, and so he goes to the fire, but it's not a friendly fire. This is where all the non-believers were. We've already seen that Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying. We've studied that as we've gone through, and that he downplayed Jesus warning that Satan had asked to sift him as wheat in Luke 22, verse 31. You know, remember what Peter said in Matthew 26, 35? Peter said to him, listen, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all his disciples. At the end of the day, what we find is that Peter was overconfident. And so you guys, most of you guys know the story. He's going to end up denying the Lord, huh? He's going to end up falling. You know, and that word fall, it, it means different things. You know, I think of some pastors that have been blessed with churches, been blessed with ministries that have been given so much grace. They've seen miracles. And, they, and they, they fall into adultery or they steal from the church. And it just makes you wonder, how, how could it happen? And, and I don't know all the details for every single person, but I do know that it probably starts with an overconfidence. You know, like, oh, that'll never happen to me. God's been using my life. I love the Lord. I've memorized 237 scriptures and, you know, whatever. I've done, you know, a thousand altar calls and whatever. I mean, listen, you guys, we are all susceptible to this. And if you don't believe that, you're in trouble. Oh, it'll never happen to me. Have you ever said that? And you just moved to the front of the line, you remember? What does the Bible say? It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You know, like for me, I've learned that the, the, the three temptations for a man are women, money, and pride. Those are the three that kind of stand out. And I've seen a lot of pastors fall into sexual sin. So I have like extra, uh, you know, I don't know, protection in that area. You know, um, I will not come to a point where I say I'm not tempted. I mean, sometimes you go to the mall, you know, and you see a pretty girl. Or maybe I shouldn't say pretty. There's only one pretty girl. That's my wife and my daughter. But whatever, you know what I'm talking about. You see a girl, she's not dressed right. And so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know what I do immediately? I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you how weak I am. My eyes bounce off and I pray a prayer like clockwork. It's a routine. Every single time, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Because I don't know. I mean, maybe God will make girls go you know, to the Disney store before I see him. I, mean, I don't know. You know, he can, I mean, you might think, well, if you're in Joseph's situation, yeah, I know what to do. I'll run. But when you're there, you just don't know. So, you know, you're, I'm praying that prayer because the bottom line is at the end of the day, I know we have to know that we're vulnerable because that's what happened with Peter. He's overconfident. I don't need to pray. So he didn't pray, right? I don't need to pray. Next thing you know, he's sleeping when he should have been praying. How many of you here, maybe you should be praying. You haven't been praying. Oh, I'm good. You're good. One day you fall. You're, you're following the Lord at a distance. That's what Peter ends up doing. You know, and that can happen in so many ways. I mean, in your heart. At the end of the day, I think that's really the most important thing. In your heart, you know you're far. And God's saying, draw near. Sometimes people don't read your Bible. They don't pray like they should. They don't go to church. There's a lot of people that... 
They say one-third of the church is missing every Sunday. Think about that. There's a lot of people that don't really have that conviction to go to church. Next thing you know, they, went, they go to the beach one Sunday, and like, I'm like, okay, all right, I understand. You give them grace. Next thing you know, they're like, hey, I liked it. It was kind of cool on Sunday, you know? So the next thing you know, they go to the brunch on the, on the following Sunday rather than going to church service, you know? And then it just kind of like, it just, it's like this snowball effect. Next thing you know, you aren't in church. You're following at a distance. I don't know how people cannot be in church on a Sunday uh, when, they, when they, they should be. I'm not saying you can never take a day off, but sometimes I think that there's a mentality that says, Lord, give me an excuse not to go. You know, for us, you guys, we have to make sure that we don't have that heart of following at a distance. Let there be no distance between you and the Lord. Have you guys ever heard that saying, I, I love him this much, this much? And you're like, wait a minute, that's not much, Manny. And what that means is that nothing comes between us. You know, what, what happened to Peter? Look, look what ends up happening to him in verse 66. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also are with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, hey, he's one of the disciples. This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them, for you are Galilean and you're and your speech shows it. And then he began to curse and, and swear. And basically what that means is, he's, I, I, I mean, God strike me down if I'm not telling the truth. I do not know this man of whom you speak. I mean, not only did he deny that, that he was a disciple of Christ, he said, I don't even know this guy. Not only, he didn't just do it once, he didn't just do it twice, three times. There's something about three in the Bible, that's kind of like saying, this is real. And so he began to curse and swear, I don't know the man of whom you speak. A second time, the rooster crowed, and then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows, you twice you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he went out and wept. And it's a, it's a really sad story. When you think about Peter... He was the leader. He was like the rock, right? When the Lord would talk to the 12, he would address Peter. When he would talk to the three, he would address Peter. I mean, he was the guy. But when you look at how it all went down, you know, when I, when I see this right here, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, here's how we'll close today. Okay, um, you look at the Jews and you're like, man, those, those bad Jews, and then you realize, well, I'm part of it. <laughs> and then you look at Peter, and you're like, that, that bad Peter, that bad Peter. But then you realize, well, that's me a lot of times. I mean, well, that's maybe some of you here, maybe, you know, you've fallen, or you've fallen away, or you distanced yourself, or you denied the Lord, or however, you know, it, it finds itself in our, in our life. You know, this message right here is, is a message of, uh, we'll call it a preventative message. Man, you know, learn from Peter so you don't do what he did. But it's not just preventative, it's redemptive. It's probably more redemptive than anything else. Because even though Peter did what he did, was God done with him? He was not even done with him, right? I mean, even though he denied him and he cursed and he sweared, you know, three times, the Lord had warned him. He didn't pray all these things. God chose him and lifted him up as an example. On the day of Pentecost, he used him in such a tremendous way. He was the one preaching to the crowds. He was the one bringing the people to the Lord and at the end of the day, when Peter died, 
You know, he was crucified, but he was crucified upside down. You know? Uh, it's so cool, his whole story. I mean, Peter, you guys know, denied the Lord. And so when Jesus rose from the grave, remember the message he sent through the angels? He says, okay, I want you guys to go tell the, the disciples and Peter. He singled them out. Make sure you tell Peter, right? And then later on, when Peter saw him, it still wasn't enough. And so Peter just said, I'm not going to serve in the ministry anymore. I'm going to go fishing. That's what it says in the Greek language, right? It's in the air is tense. I'm done. I'm going fishing. I'm not going to follow the calling of my life, right? But what did the Lord do? He went after him. He went after him. Hey, you guys caught any fish? No, hey, try this side. And he, you know, this crazy catch. And then he comes and he invites Peter over. He's already making fish tacos for him. He's setting them. And what does he do? He says, hey, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Not just be a Christian again. Tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of my flock. Peter, I, fa- I, I prayed for you. And, and when you return, strengthen your brethren. I mean, talk about grace. I don't care what you've done in your life. You may have fallen. You may have denied the Lord. You know, you may feel like, you know, God's done with me. This is what's going on right here. He's coming after you right now. He's coming after you. And he's just saying, I love you. I died for you. If I can do this with Peter, I can do this with you. What do you say? Let's serve the Lord together. I pray that we would know that. I don't know what God's called you to do, but I do know this, that there is not any position in the body that's greater than another. Wherever it is, whatever part of the church that God's called you to, man, whatever you do, understand that the grace of God not only leads you, but he equips you to be able to serve in that place where, like Peter, you know, you're going you're gonna to impact the kingdom of God. One last thing. I was, I was going through this thing right here, and I was thinking about the whole rooster thing, roosters. Um, what do roosters, do you guys ever trip out on roosters? Why do they crow like that? You know, why do they do that? We well, you know why are, and so scientists, they studied roosters, and they're like, how do they work? And so they actually put them in dark and light, and they did all these experiments on them. And what they found was within the rooster, there's like an internal clock that God gave them to, I guess you could say, wake people up. How many of you guys have alarm clocks, you know? Well, before the, your alarm clocks and your phones, there were roosters. <laughs> there were roosters. I remember a while uh, back, um, we actually, you know, in my, in my house one day, we're, we're, it's early in the morning, my wife and I are asleep in bed. Next thing you know, we hear a rooster crow in West Covina. And so I guess our neighbor, and she was a lover of animals, and we loved all the animals. Shelly didn't like the rooster, though. Um, you know, because I was already up and stuff, but man, the rooster would wake her up every morning. And so don't tell anybody I told you, but she called the city and told on them. She said, hey, man, that's, a, that's illegal. Getting rid of the rooster, Okay. So here's the thing. I'll close with this. Um, I don't know. Maybe you need a rooster. <laughs> a spiritual rooster in which God is saying to someone who's been sleeping, time to wake up. Time to wake up and to live your life for Jesus Christ. Time to make that decision to follow him, to to live for him. No longer, you know, sleepy or tired, but vibrant and awake and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I do pray if there's anyone here today who needs to return, like, like Peter, he turned, but he returned. That's the difference between him and Judas. That's the difference between Saul and David. That's the difference between everybody who goes to heaven or hell. Not that one's better than the other. Jesus is all that matters. If you're here today and you need to make that decision to wake up and follow God, I pray, I beg of you, please, don't leave without making that decision.
Okay, let me pray with you. Lord, I, I just thank you for your, your word, your love, your grace. Lord, I, I thank you for what you did in saving us and redeeming us. Lord, I pray that you would just instill within us a heart of gratitude to be able to see this for what it is, that amazing expression of love. But Lord, to respond to it in a way that if God loves me, even though I'm all messed up, even though I've blown it, or denied him, he still loves me, he's still coming after me. And Lord, help me to love you back. I would even say, Lord, that there are some here who can't do it on their own strength. So, Lord, I pray that today you would meet that person or those people, God, and that today you would give them a new beginning. Encourage us, Lord, I pray in these things. Just continue to bless your, your church, your families that are represented here, your people. All that's going on, I, I, I see Nadine, I can't help but think of her and be with our sister, Lord. Be with all those, the different trials, struggles. God, be our strength. We do love you and thank you, Father, and we pray you continue to work in our hearts. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. We got one more song to sing, and I pray that you would do that to Him from your heart in an act of worship. And and again, don't forget we got burritos in the back. But even more important than that, you know, just make sure that you uh, you don't leave without understanding and getting a good grip on the love of Jesus Christ for your life. Okay. God bless you.
Set a fire, guys. Set a fire down in my soul. I can't contain, I can't control. Set a fire. Set a fire down in my soul. I can't contain, I can't control. So set a fire down in my soul. I can't contain, I can't control. Let's declare it, guys, one more time. Set a fire. Set a fire. God bless you guys. Have a great afternoon.